Welcome everybody to the November Escribiente meeting. Tonight, our presentation will be by, given by special guest, Reggie Izell, who many of you already know. Elizabeth, would you like to introduce our guest? I am thrilled to welcome my friend and one of the most widely known and best beloved calligraphy teachers in the world, Reggie Izell. If you haven't taken a class from Reggie, it is likely that you have studied with someone who has taken a class from Reggie. He is still offering his online, now online class, classes. So the opportunity to study with him is still there. When I started to look for a presenter for a program on SUMI, I called John Neal, thinking that he might have a supplier who would like to talk about their products, but he didn't. And then we both quickly agreed that Reggie would be the best person to ask. So take it away, Reggie. So hi, I'm Reggie. I'm down in my basement in my studio. I wish you could be here with me. Uh, got a classroom, fit 12 people. Uh, got a studio and a gallery. So I wish you were all here, but uh, this is second best. So uh, we're gonna look at uh, stick inks and grinding stones tonight, both uh, the black stick inks and the color stick inks. And, um, I'm going to get rid of me and uh, get the really important thing on the screen, and that's the ink sticks and the grinding stones. So uh, there we are. Uh, first of all, I'll talk to you about the ink sticks, and this is a black stick ink. And uh, the ones from uh, Boku Undo, those are the ones that are uh, carried by John Neal. This is uh, a, cal a, cal a catalog of his, uh, if I zoom in right here. Here's a page from it. And uh, this was uh, summer of 2019. And these are the ones that I recommend right here. Uh, it's still the same catalog numbers, IS-10, IS-11, IS-12. And I do believe that uh, as we were jabbering away earlier on, Sharon looked these up and I think she said the last one uh, has been discontinued. So they still have these two. So I highly recommend those. Uh, and I'll be telling you why, wherefore, et cetera. So um, all of these, and I think just about all the black stick inks that John sells uh, come in this, oh, a pretty little wooden box. And so I have it encased in a Ziploc baggie. And there's a reason for that. And also in the Ziploc baggie is a desiccant, you know, one of those things that you get with a pair of shoes or in a smaller one than a pill box, they suck away any potential um, moisture from what they're packed in. And so that's a good thing when it comes to the stick inks. You would like to have it in a plastic bag, zipped up with a desk kit. That way uh, you don't get any of the moisture in the air damaging the ink stick. And I even put a little cotton ball there, like, you know, you get a cotton ball in a aspirin bottle, and that does the same thing, draws the moisture. And so I know this is overkill, so you probably don't have to do this, but uh, the reason for it is this, that uh, once you grind this, and if you accidentally forget to dry the end off, uh, the ink draws the moisture from the tip there and also from out of the air. And when you open the box a second or third time, nothing may seem amiss, but uh, after a while, there'll be cracks and crazes in here and stuff will start crumpling off and it'll be unusable. And so you don't want that because it's unusable and these things aren't cheap. So uh, other times you open the box and it may have just cracked in half or in thirds. And that's due to the moisture getting to it. And so, as I said, this is all overkill, but nice for you to know about it. And just in case you want to wear suspenders and a belt, it doesn't hurt. So there you go. So here's our little uh, stick ink right here. And uh, a lot of times the first thing that people look at is the cost of the ink stick. And, you know, these are going to be 30, 40 bucks. And they go, whoa, I don't want to spend that much. Okay. But I do want to put it in perspective. And that is if you just use this ink stick, and you didn't use any more of your gouaches or watercolors in black or of your black bottle inks. This would probably last you anywhere from a year to three years. And uh, it's going to elevate the quality of your work if you use it. 
and we'll be discussing that. So, got it. And uh, black stick inks are comprised of black carbon and fish glue, and <laughs> usually something to mask that with uh, sandalwood. And uh, all of those are very organic. And so because they're organic, sometimes there's a little thing put in here to discourage the growth of uh, bacteria and mold. And so everything is organic in the black stick inks. And I'm emphasizing that because that's gonna become important down the road just a little bit. So, you know, with black stick inks, we're gonna discuss how you choose them, why, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're gonna do that once we start grinding. So we'll try to have an action-packed evening of grinding sticking. Okay, only calligraphers will be excited about watching <laughs> sticking get ground. So I'm gonna set that aside momentarily and then I'll back away just a little bit. And here, tiptoeing over here is our grinding stone. And our grinding stone is very heavy, very dense. It's uh, uh, <laughs> This is the traditional shape right here. It's a, uh, I always liken it to the shape of a swimming pool. Most of it is a shallow end right here that goes on a decline and then it drops off precipitously and uh, you have the, deep into the pool here. This two thirds right here is your grinding surface. And then down here, the deep end, the well, that's where you'll keep it. And this is made of slate and it's a very dense stone. So it's gonna be very heavy. Uh, when you pick up different ink stones, if you go, oh, heavy, you pick another, oh, heavy. Then all of a sudden you pick up one, you go, whoa, that's really lightweight. That's gonna be a composite. And I would stay away from those. I have not had good experience with those. I would stay with the ones that are slate, heavyweight. So your traditional slate grinding stone for the black stick ink is going to look like a swimming pool, okay? I'm going to show you some alternatives to that once we get done here. But I wanna get started right here because gosh, I gotta make up those three minutes somehow. So all I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take my little jar of distilled water and my pipette. And one of the mistakes that people make in grinding black stick ink is they, they think of too great a volume. They, sometimes they think of a, a bottle of ink and they'll put all this water in here and they'll start grinding. And 45 minutes later, we're in when they're in the ambulance being taken away to the hospital and their elbows in permanent lock, they go, man, I'm never using that stuff again. I don't, only got pale gray. Well, they just had too much water in there. And so you got easy does it when you're grinding the stick ink. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your dropper and water. Whoops, almost forgot. I had said the grinding surface here is on a kind of decline. And so if you put your water here and start grinding, it automatically wants to start drizzling down there uncontrollably. And it's very irritating when it does that. So take something that's fairly narrow, like a pencil, and put it under the end where it wants to dribble down into, okay? And that'll prevent it. So at this point, what had been a decline right here, the grinding surface now is pretty much parallel with the surface of the table. So that way, when you do put your water in there, and I always liken it to about the width of a, a nickel, say. And so you start obviously very narrow, very wet, just water wet. And then you take whatever side of the ink stick that day seems to you to give you the greatest leverage and you begin grinding. This is not an athletic event. And so you're letting the ink stick and the grinding stone do the work for you. This is a very, very fine grit to this stone. And so because it's a fine grit, it's going to give you very, very fine particles. And that's great because then you can get a great hairline. Uh, if you have experienced sometimes, let's say maybe you've tried to letter with a an ochre or an umber, something like that, very earthen from watercolors or washes. And those particles can be pretty big. So you're getting a very gritty kind of feel to the flow of those. Well, you won't have this here because the ink stick that I'm gonna show you 
and uh, with a grinding stone, you're going to have a very, very fine, fine uh, fluid here with very small particles that will give you a very delicate hairline. And so what you're going to try to do is go from watery wet to something that's too thick. When I have my students grind, oh, grind, mix gouaches, I always tell them begin by mixing it too thick and then incrementally drop by drop with your water, water it down to the consistency you want. And it's the same thing here. You, you're gonna deliberately make this too thick. And then you'll, when you're going to use it, go ahead and water it down. Now, let me see if I can come over here. We'll get it at a different angle, maybe, maybe. Okay. And what I'll do is, I guess the best thing to do here is to zoom in. Then we'll see what we can get. Yeah, that's pretty zoomed right there. And so, so I'm not gonna talk anymore. I'm just gonna do this for the remaining 50 minutes. No, <laughs> everyone falls asleep. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, and I would, I'm hoping the light will strike it properly. I'm going to take the stick and I'm going to press hard and I'm gonna run it through what I just ground and see if it's showing what I want it to show. Not yet. I'll grind it another minute. Because what's gonna happen is the ink will separate and it's not gonna be dramatic, but it's going to separate and stay separated for a second or two. And by it separating like that and staying separated for an instant, that means it's too thick. I think you can see right here. There's a segment there. Right here, it's separated. It's hard to see. You're going to have to take my word for it. So once it's too thick like that, then what I'll do is I'll put another, just about the same amount of water in there and start grinding. Oh, you can see actually there where the ink separated. I'm going to back off a little bit and then grind again. So in general, what I'll do is I'll grind and then add water and then grind and add water and grind and add water. And then after three of those go rounds like that, making sure that the ink is thick enough or too thick as I showed you by doing this. And what I always liken it to is Moses in the Red Sea. You want to be Moses, you don't want to be Pharaoh. So it separates, and it's not as dramatic as the Red Sea. It'll separate slightly, and then it'll go back, but that means it's too thick, and that's a good thing. So what I'll do that is do that three times, and then I'll push that down into the well, and I'll start the process again. And this seems like a lot of work, but once again, I'm not pressing hard. I'm letting the ink stone in the stick ink do the work itself. Uh, when I was trying some of the uh, inks the other day for John Neal, the new color ones, I found that if by grinding those for about 15 minutes, it gave me enough writing fluid for about two days. So that's not bad. And I mean, that was a lot of writing for those two days. So I'm going to do this again. Nope. So I'm going to suggest to you if you do this for maybe 15 minutes, or if you want to go two 10-minute intervals, you're going to have enough for several days worth of lettering. Why would you use black stick ink? Okay. It gives you the greatest control of any writing fluid in black that you'll ever use. If you use a good one, you'll perceive the difference in the control you get with it versus any other black. Okay, one more time now. Uh, in one of my year-long courses in Chicago, there was this lady, her name was Lila Kuchma, and she was really this very 
large woman who made these huge tapestries and very, you know, very good artist, excellent artist. And uh, I had him using stick ink for the first time that day and the room was very quiet and she was at the back of the room and all of a sudden Lila piped up, oh, it stays where you put it. <laughs> and that was the best way to describe what black stick ink does. It just is the absolute best for control of flow. And that's what you're after. And I mean, whether it's the broad edge pen or the pointed pen. Uh, my friend Mike Kessig, that's what he uses for his pointed pen lettering. Mike's great. And so right now, as you can see, this has stayed put. It hasn't dribbled down into the well. And that's because we put that pencil supporting the end where the well is, the deep end of the swimming pool. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it off. And now I'm going to tilt it. And I'm going to push this down. And I think you can see very readily, as I've pushed it down, you can see the streaks. And that's an indicator that the ink is thicker. So it might be about the consistency of thin cream or half and half right now. So we push that down for the first time and there's still all this on here. Don't let that bother you because that's good that that's on there and you'll see why. Now, I'm gonna start again and okay. So in my estimation, if I put water in, grind and push it down, um, grind, put water in, grind, put water in, grind, then push it down to the well. And if I do that three times, that generally gives me enough ink for at least a day or two or more of lettering. Once again, it depends on how big the nib is and other things. So it really goes a long way for the work you're investing in it. And need I say it again, I'm not pushing hard on this. I'm letting the ink stick and the grinding stone do the work. Okay, so what I want to tell you is how do you choose a black stick ink? Well, you know that calligraphers are probably the most generous people in the world. And as soon as they get a new book or a new nib or a new ink, they just want to share it with you. And so that includes whatever knowledge they have about something. And so you may be at a workshop. I mean, back in the day when there were live workshops, <laughs> you may be at a live workshop and out of the corner of your ear, you hear somebody say, why, yes, I use stick ink all the time. And it's really important. If you're going to buy a black stick ink, always, always get the one that has one dot at the top. Don't ever get the one that has five dots. You go, oh boy, I'm gonna write this down. One of these days, I'm gonna get some black stickings. And then you go to your next workshop and out of the corner of your ear, you hear someone say, why, yes, I was using my black sticking the other day and I only use the one that has five dots at the top. Never, never get one that has one dot. And so a lot of times people will give information with limited experience. And so, you know, stick inks are not cheap. They're expensive. They're an investment. And so you would like to talk to someone who's really tried ink stick and ink sticks a lot. And you can depend on them. Now, the reason that <laughs> I know about black stick inks is because way back in the mid-1980s, out of a one-bedroom apartment, I started a business called Pendragon. <laughs> and so, uh, lo and behold, the best manufacturer of ink sticks in the world, Boku Undo, they uh, sent a sales rep for the first time to establish themselves in New York City. And I guess this guy went through all sorts of <laughs> uh, phone books or something because he saw a thing for Pendragon. And he must have thought I was a real business. And so he was a great guy. His name was Matsue. And he phones me up and both of us are kind of nodding, pretending like what the other one said. And uh, he said in a very polite way, uh, would you do us the great favor of if we would send you all of our ink sticks and all of our grinding stones, would you try them for us? 
and give us feedback? Well, I had to think a long time about that one, huh? And uh, so they sent me everything. They did. And uh, the conclusion that I came to is this, that if you were using a brush and unsized paper from the East, then you could determine from price how good that ink stick was going to work for you. But because we're using metal nibs on Western papers that are highly sized, there is no way of knowing either by price or appearance how that ink is going to perform. And so you have to rely on someone's experience. And so I was able to try all of those. And from all of those, and there were a lot, uh, I gleaned it down to about five ink sticks and two different ink stones. And even at that, the ink sticks all performed really well. It was just a subjective thing about how you felt they flowed and how they looked. I think you can see that I've been shooting off all the hot air here uh, in my talking. You can see how thick this has gotten and that I was grinding. So I'll push more down. And this is really thick. This is really almost pasty. So this is the second time I'm pushing it down. And then I'll put the pencil under here again and I'll go one more time. So once again, B-O-K-U-N-D-O, Boko Undo is the manufacturer. If you think of Windsor Newton art products in the West as being the best in, the, in, the, in uh, Western art supplies, then that place is occupied by Boko Undo in the East. And so I highly respect all of their products. And uh, you can rely on them being archival. And after that, you know, it's up to you to make the decisions uh, which one you're going to get. I want to talk to you a little bit later about splitting an ink stick with a buddy so you can cut the cost in half if you wish. And then there's ways to economize. Um, I'll probably lose my train of thought. <laughs> Not that I have one really, but uh, if someone wants to ask a question, I'll, I'll pause right now. You can ask a question, except for Beth, she can't. Mm -hmm. There's a couple questions in the chat. Yeah. Okay. One is from Mila. She asking your handout indicated that there may be animal soot versus wood soot. Is there a way to know which is which? You know, at one time uh, there were. The, the byproducts, whatever got thrown away was burned and then the soot was gathered on a little dome. These days, most of the time, they either uh, burn uh, certain types of pine and collect that, or they have oil and they collect that. And I have a little uh, image to show you guys uh, through screen share what that looks like. And so in essence, basically what they do, let's pretend like the, that you're uh, burning oil. And the oil comes from different objects. And so when they burn that oil, there's a dome over that. And as that burns, the wick burns and soot rises from it, it collects on the dome. And so there's the carbon that collects on that dome. And that is the pure carbon. <laughs> it's not going to go anywhere. You can expose it to direct sunlight for a thousand years, and it's going to be as black as anything. So uh, that's where they get the um, carbon uh, for this product. There was a time when uh, especially Chinese ink sticks, you didn't necessarily know what was going into it. It was like, uh, <laughs> uh, you just didn't know. So uh, there were things that happened sometimes longer stories that uh, we don't have time to tell right now that are interesting, but uh, that's what you're looking at right now. And there are some good videos on YouTube uh, on the making of black stick inks. If like anything else, there are some good ones and not so good ones, but I would, I would go on YouTube uh, and take a look and see. Some of them were pretty good. So this is the third time of the third time that I'm grinding right here. And I'm going, oh, there. you said there was a second question. What was the second question? Yes, um, Della asks if before the end of 
the um, before you finish, could you please show how to load the nib? No, I won't show that. I, I do that only once a year on special occasions, New Year's <laughs> Eve. And can we pretend okay. it's New Year's Eve? It, since it's Della, I will I will show her. It, I wouldn't have shown it if anyone else asked. Okay. And yeah, Elizabeth, absolutely. Elizabeth, um, ha, Beth had a, a comment a little while ago, but when you were talking about the carbon, uh, yeah. she said carbon capture, exclamation point. <laughs> yes, we're being uh, very green with our black sticking. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> so I'm going to, I, I know just by the feel of it. And I, I, can you see that it's separating? Yes. Okay. So if I go this way, it seems like when I go that way, you guys can kind of see. And of course, when I push it down, you can really see it. And once again, people kind of get all torqued out about all this good ink that's still on the grinding surface. What am I going to do? I don't want to waste anything. You won't. Now, then, the one thing that is very important you got to attend to right now is this. You got a lot of wet at the end of this ink stick right here. And you don't want to leave it on there. Absolutely not. It's detrimental. If the wet stays there, is going to migrate in. And as I mentioned before, it's going to get in there. And the first, next time you open up the box, it's like, oh, it's good. But the second or third time you open up that box, all that tip there is going to be cracked and crazed and crumble apart. Now, you have to grind the ink stick. So those particles are not going to dissolve into usable ink. You're wasting it. And so what you want to do right now is... You want to take a, a very, very clean cotton cloth like this <laughs> that you save for this occasion and you do this. I would use a cotton cloth, not a paper towel, because the ink in I think, the glue in this, the fish glue, we hadn't talked about that yet. The fish glue in this is really strong stuff, really strong. And it'll pull up a lot of the fibers out of the paper towels. And you just really don't want that. So I didn't get this super dry, but what I'm going to do is blow it off a little bit, and then I'm going to take something to set this on to air dry. So I've got my little box right there. I'm going to let that air dry. And once it's air dry, then I'm going to put it back in the box, and I'm going to put my little cotton ball back in with there, and I'm going to put that in my Ziploc baggie with a desiccant, and it's going to be good for who knows how many years, okay? So, I'm going to set that aside for right now. Anybody have any questions about what we just did? Neela, Neela says, <laughs> so are Japanese ink stick, sticks preferred over Chinese sticks in terms of quality? I cannot tell you that because uh, I've always stuck with the Boku Undo. And uh, I do believe that in John Neal's catalog that, um, let's see, you and Clayton. That guy's very dependable. He's he's rock solid when it comes to information. And there are several ink sticks that he recommends there. And one of them may be Chinese, but I'm not sure. I think most of them are Japanese. So you'd have to find somebody who really has used these things for years. Because I'm sure there's going to be some good Chinese ones. But uh, I know Boku Undo. And so that's what I've st stuck with all these years. Okay. All right, so I'd said that the components in the black stick ink are the carbon, the glue, which is fish glue. Now, fish glue is extremely strong, but it's also very flexible. And that's a real asset, like if you're lettering in a book and you have to bend the pages, there's not going to be any cracking. So the other thing about that is that sometimes maybe if you've, say, addressed envelopes, that you will maybe draw lines on an envelope or on a certificate. And then you'll letter on it and you will have maybe use gouache. And then you go to erase it. And when you erase, the color of the gouache may smear or pale out because there's just a minimal, minimal, minimal amount of binder gum arabic in the tube of gouache. And so very often in using gouache, what we'll do is we'll put a drop or two extra of gum arabic in there, more binder. So that then when you go to erase, you don't have that problem of paling out or smearing. Well, you will never have that problem with the black stick ink. 
This fish glue is so strong. You'll never have to add any extra binder. I am shooting my mouth off here. And as I do so, this is drying out right here. And this is what I want to do. And this is what I want to show you. I'm going to take my mixing brush and I'm going to put some water on here. And I'm always using distilled water because that way I know it's archival. I don't use water from the tap because it can have negative results in terms of the longevity of the fluid or how the fluid operates. And so I'm going to take whatever I can and get it liquidy and push it down into the well. And even at that, gosh darn, there's still a bunch of good ink on there. That's okay. That's okay. In fact, that's really preferred if there is some. And I'm going to do it one more time now because I can, because the ink down in the well is so stiff. I ground it nice and thick. So now here we go. I'm just going to do this, push it down there and let it be. Now then let's pretend that you're going to <clears throat> be using this for a couple days. There's enough ink here that you can kind of letter for at least a couple or more days, a couple hours each day. That's how much we just ground right there. And I don't know how long we did it. If anybody's putting a stopwatch on it, maybe 15 minutes or so. And I was stopping and talking. And so this is a lot of ink. Now then you can just work directly from out of the grinding stone if you wish, okay? However, I would really suggest to you that you take a six part mixing pan like this. By the way, one of my favorite places these days is Dollar Tree, six mixing pans for a dollar, okay? <laughs> Hard to beat. And so uh, what I would suggest is that you take your, can you see? Okay, yeah, I'm on, I'm on camera and do this. As you can see, I've just about filled one up and here's another one that's gonna have a lot in it. And I would work with it like that from out of that six part mixing pan. And what I would tell you is this, if you can get a piece of glass or plexi that's four inches by six inches, and then what you can do, I'm gonna dry off the edge of this grinding stone real quick and splatter ink on my table. And what I wanna show you is this. If I were working with what's left in here, I'd still have a lot to work with. Now, the cool thing is this, that if something gets into you, Lord only knows, and you've put too much water down here, okay? And it's like, oh, I ruined it. What can I do? No problem. Because all you have to do is take that too thin, that you thinned out too much accidentally, and bring it up here and put it here with that super thick stuff or even dried up stuff. And then you'll get the happy medium that you want to. So indeed, none of this is wasted right here, okay? So if I'm working directly from out of this, I can, I'll usually feed my nib with this stuff. And then if I feel like, whoa, what was I thinking? I got it too thin. I can just come up here, take my mixing brush, feed my nib, okay? Are any questions about that? Okay, then what I want to show you is this. If I am indeed working a couple of days or maybe more out of here, what I'll do is I'll put a little bit of water on the edges of this thing. And then I'll take my little sheet of glass or plexi and I'll put it over it. And that forms enough of a water seal. It may not be airtight, but not much air is going to get to it. So that when I come back the next day or whenever I come back, this stuff's good to go. Might have to put a drop or two of water in it, but it's good. Okay. So if you were to work directly from out of here like that, that would be the process. But as I said, I would really suggest that you go ahead and what I'm going to do here, I'm going to put even more in here. And this will, this may be a little bit too thin now, but that's okay because you can put the ink into the indentations in a sequence in which you can either label it or remember which were, was the thicker, which was the 
thinner or the thinner wrist. And so I'm gonna say that's as much as I can do. Now then, I wanna go back to the grinding zone for just a minute and tell you this. I've tried to emphasize with the black stick ink that everything in it is organic, okay? So I'm using my black stick ink the first day. I'm going, wow, where have you been all my life? I'm in love, geez. I'm never going to use anything else. And then the second day, you feel the same way. And the third day, pretty much. And just in case <laughs> you actually ground up enough to go another day or so, you start lettering with it. You go, what the heck? I, am I just imagining things? Was, was that one of those things where I, I just convinced myself it was so good? Because right now it's, I don't know what it is. It doesn't flow the same way. And you're right. Because the glue there, being as organic as it is, it grows a chain and it gets longer and longer. With the, In a few days then, it becomes a little bit slimy. And so it's not a happy ink anymore. You know, you got to get rid of it. But seldom will you grind up so much <laughs> as to have that happen. You probably will quit just a little sooner in the grinding process. So you need to know about that. Oh, by the way, this uh, somebody has said this to me the other day. They said, you know, go to the dollar store and get a, uh, a dollar frame, <laughs> four inches by six inches. There's your piece of glass for this. So uh, that seemed pretty cost effective. Now then. The thing you should know about the grinding stone is this, that it's slate and uh, heavy, very compact. Uh, but as soon as you possibly can, wash this out. And when you wash it out, never use anything more than an old toothbrush and hot water. Don't use any soap. Don't use anything more abrasive. Although, this slate is relatively dense and slightly repellent to water. It also is slightly absorbent. And so if you have any soap that you're trying to wash this out with, the soap will permeate that. And then for the next several times, when you go to try to grind up the black stick ink, you get black froth. And so you've really wasted your time and the materials. So nothing more than hot water and an old toothbrush nothing more abrasive, and try to wash that out as soon as possible. In my year-long classes, I would bring materials to class, and I would rely on people washing this out at the end of the last class. Uh, then sometime next year, I would take them back out, and lo and behold, somebody hadn't quite washed it out. And so in trying to wash out at that time, this is a testimony to how very strong that fish glue is, it uh, started chipping off a layer or two of the uh, slate down in the well. So that wasn't terrible because it's down in the well. It's not where you're grinding. But it just tells you, please, you know, for your own sake, for the longevity of your grinding stone, wash that out as soon as you can. And obviously, if you've transferred most of the content of this into your mixing pan, then you're good to go to just wash it out right away once you're, you've transferred that out. Are there any questions about that right now? I do see a comment from Della referring to what you said earlier. She says, uh, ready for Christmas, you might get a lump of coal. <laughs> well, that's all I ever get anyways. So why should this be any difference? Yeah. Okay, so all right, all right. Just to forestall that coal, uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to scoot this aside for a second. And I've got my, I'll show it to you with two different nibs. I've got, uh, and I better zoom in some here. I personally like Mitchell nibs, but I hate the reservoirs. So most of the time when I use my Mitchell nib, I'm, uh, for my own work, I'm at a slant board with a fairly steep pitch. And so having no reservoir doesn't matter because the position of the pen is such that the inks are not going to flow out until I say, whoa, go, go for it. But now these days, having to give classes with Zoom, I'm working on a flat tabletop. So whatever nibs I'm using to demonstrate with the Zoom classes, uh, I have to have a reservoir. 
And so as much as I dislike the reservoirs from the Mitchell Nibs, this is a homemade reservoir right here. And it's just real cheap and easy to make. It's made from um, a jewelry wire, the thinnest gauge of jewelry wire. And uh, uh, you should know about this. Um, I have about 300 videos on YouTube, and they're scattered off the all over the YouTube universe. Uh, I do have, if you go to YouTube and you type in Reggie Ezel channel, then all my videos are right there. And so then all you have to do is put in a keyword like um, reservoir, <laughs> and you'll go to the video that shows you how to make this reservoir. It's really easy. Uh, so if you like the Mitchell Nibs uh, and want to have a reservoir on it, that's what's happening here. Otherwise, uh, I'll show you also on a uh, speedball. So I've got the underside of the nib facing me, and I'll take my nib and I'll rake it across the underside of the nib several times, and I'll overfill it. There's way too much ink on here right now. And I'll even put a little dab at the tip of the nib. And then what I'll do is I'll do a snap shake three or four times maybe, and then I'll turn the nib upside down. And this is why especially I have the paper towel under this. Yeah, it protects the tabletop. But I do this little micro drag. I just, whoop, and that siphons off just enough of the ink from off the top so that then when you set the nib down, you get a crisp stroke. Too often when you load your nib, whether it's dipping it or feeding it with a brush, you uh, get so much on there. And then when you set it down, it goes blab and it's not a happy day. So this is a way of getting a good crisp stroke to begin with. Once again, it's this. I'm gonna show it to you in slow motion. This is for Della. I'm raking it across. <laughs> Sorry, I can't keep doing that. Raking it across, overf overfilling it. And then snap shake a few times. And then I've got the underside facing me. So the top side, I just do this little micro drag and that siphons off just enough. Now I'm good to go. So that's uh, with the reservoir on the uh, Mitchell nib. And then I've got a speedball nib here. And so all I have to do with that is rake it across either side of the nib reservoir. And I'll do some on the bottom and I'll tap it at the top. And once again, the whole idea is to put too much on there. And then if I do a snap shake two or three, four times, and then the little micro drag to the top of it, I'm good to go. All right. You know, while we're at it, let me tell you one valuable little thing. This is, this is going to be your new best friend if you don't know this already. Gum Arabic liquid. And all I do is this, whether it's a new nib or whether it's a nib that I put on the pin handle with my oily fingers, you've got oil on that nib. And then when you go to use it, it repels your writing fluid. So what you want to do is get a paper towel, hardest part of the day, get the cap off the gum Arabic. And then just put, I can get closer, can I? Just put a little bit of gum Arabic on your paper towel. And then give the nib a gum Arabic rub down. Just lightly in there, and then rub off all the gum arabic that you can. And what that's going to do is, and now instead of having an oily film on here, you've got a sticky film. So whatever you put on there as a writing fluid, it's not going to slither off uncontrollably. But if you have a new nib, it generally has oil on it. Or if you've taken your oily fingers and put that nib onto the pin handle, it's got oil on it. And so I always say, you know, metal nib equals gum Arabic rub down. And that'll get your nib ready to go from the get go. And so close that again. And so with the nib here, I just overloaded it. And whatever nib you're using, snap shake a few times, micro drag, you're good to go. Questions about what we just did here. There was yeah. a question from Della, is it the same for a straight nib? What do you mean by a straight nib? 
She was talking about like a pointed nib, like for some serious. Oh, pointed nib. Yeah, so that, that's what I would do. I am not a great pointed pen person. I do it when I have to, but uh, that's what I do. That's what I do, you know, uh, with any of my nib. I overload it, snap shake, micro drag, go, go to town. Mm -hmm. so. so we talked about the contents of the uh, stick ink, the black stick ink, how we want this to be very dry. And I would wait another hour or so before I would box it up and put it away. And uh, now, why don't I almost try to be tidy here? I'll get a little bit of this off here, just so you don't talk about me. And then I'll do the same thing here in terms of just putting some dots of water on the flat places here. I should zoom in, see if you can see it better. So I think you can see some dots here and there of the water where I put it. And then there too, once again, we can just have a little water seal. So when we come back, all that stuff is not dried up. Okay. So the care and feeding of your black stick ink, and then the care and feeding of your grinding stone, cleaning it as soon as possible with water and uh, paint, water and uh, toothbrush. And uh, I want to show you a couple other shapes of grinding stones. Matsue, the guy who is a sales rep from Boku Undo, was so conscientious and, of course, polite. And uh, when I was giving him feedback over the course of several months, um, one of the things I, I just mentioned to him was this, that with the traditional shape of the grinding stone, this well is so large that uh, it evaporates and thickens quite fast, the ink does. And so uh, I said, you know, there's no big deal there. All we got to do is remember to put some water in every few minutes. And of course, even with the indentations of a mixing pan, you still have to do that with wash. Not as frequently, though, because there are smaller indentations. So this big exposure to the air was a little bit inconvenient. Okay, so uh, I didn't think anything of it because I just it was information. It wasn't a criticism. And so a few months goes by and uh, doorbell rings, UPS man, I go there. There's this heavy little box and I open it up. And to my surprise, <laughs> he has had specially made for Western calligraphers, a totally new grinding stone. And so whether you can see this very well or not, all of this is the grinding surface and it's flat. You don't have to prop anything up with a pencil, okay? This is all flat. And so this is a huge grinding area. It's very, very fine slate. And then there's this little indentation here that as you grind it and it's thick enough, you can push it in there. And so uh, I, I was so flattered that he would actually make that for us. And so this is what John Neal is selling basically now. I'm pretty sure this is the one that he sells. And so um, you're only going to have one grinding stone your whole life. It's, it'll outlast you, believe me. And so if you can invest in this one, please do do that. Uh, you'll be very happy that you did. And there are two, you know, you can just put the little glass over it as well with the uh, water on the rim. And this has a little pour spout too. So I was, and, uh, and Matsue, when I asked him what it was named, he said, it's a, it's a penistone, penistone. <laughs> so it's a stone for the pen, you know? So uh, this is the way we communicated. There's a lot of head nodding in our phone conversations. So uh, I was so happy for that. Now then maybe someone has given you uh, grinding stone like this. It's round and it's flat and there's not much area. If you've got one of these, you can absolutely use it. Absolutely. You know, if you don't want to buy anything else, it's very serviceable. And most of them do have a pour spout. So all you have to do is grind up a relatively small amount. And then when you see that it's a little bit on the thick side, like thin cream, then you can use your brush and then coax it out into the indentations of a mixing pan and then do it again. 
pour it out, do it again, pour out. The problem is that if you try and get all of it ground at one time, you're already knee deep in the stuff. And it's very hard to get a visual read as to how thick or thin it is after a few minutes. So uh, it's very serviceable. Uh, but if you're gonna buy a grinding stone, if you can pop for it, that's the one you'd like to get. Otherwise get the one that's traditional swimming pool shape. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is oh, this. Stella oh. does have a question about brushes. She yes. wants to know if you have a preference on brush, on your brush. You no, know, I, I like a small broad edge brush, about a quarter inch uh, broad edge brush to feed the nibs with. That's my preference. And the stiffer the bristles, the better. So usually a, a cheap hog hair one is good. Uh, I'm, I'm blowing it here. I'm using my good broad edge brush here for a mixing brush tonight. I, I Shame on me, I shouldn't be showing it to you. But if you get a quarter inch uh, wide uh, stiff bristle brush, it's good, it's good. Yes, I know what I was gonna tell you. This is a bamboo sticking holder. It's two little pieces of uh, bamboo and it has this little slit and a little notch here, this little guy. And what it is, it's, remember the old Chinese torture thing? Ow, ow, my finger, my finger. Okay, that's not for this. But what it is for is this. If you come back and let's say you go, oh man, my ink stick, it's broken and it's just little nubs now, it's hard to hold. Not anymore, because you can take that nub and put it into the jaws of the bamboo sticking holder and then slide this peg forward and it holds it very tightly. And then you have the distance here and you get really good leverage to grind it with. Whereas if you just had the little nub, you fingers would get very weary very fast and very messy very fast. Also, what you always need for all your fine writing with an ink stick is a hacksaw. Okay, no, if you wanna save money and you wanna split uh, stick ink, whether it's black or in color with a buddy, this, anything that has a serrated edge, it can be a saw, it can be a knife, anything. And the black stick inks have four sides to them. So all you have to do is make a little groove in all four sides. And then let's see if I can do this I mean, without making you seasick. There you go. Then you take the stick and where you have made the little grooves in it, you hold it over the edge of the table, you stand and with your shoulder strongly over this part, you snap it and it breaks very crisply. And so you can literally cut the cost in half of any of the stickings that you want. So all you need is something with a serrated blade and a French will go in. So then again, that would be uh, another instance in which you would really like to have your bamboo sticking holder to hold your less than whole sticking kit. Okay. Now I wanna come on over here to the and you get this gorgeous, gorgeous vermilion stick ink right here. And it's, once, it's terrible. Once you see it and you use it, you go, I need that. <laughs> Your heart just melts, you know? And uh, so back in the day, uh, I, when I would have them use these in class, uh, the catalog would have a number that would say G dash and a number. And so with a piece of tape, I would label these with a G number on them. And so this one was G17. And they would have some names sometimes, and this was the Vermilion, and it was not cheap. And so um, what you would have to do is you would have to have something to grind the color stick in. And that something is called a Gakin dish. Rhymes with bacon, gakin. And so here's our gakin dish and it's uh, unglazed ceramic. And the grit of it is made ex specifically for grinding the color stick ink. Now then back in the day, <laughs> the gakin dishes had two sides to them. And on one side, you could grind the cool colors, red, orange, yellow. 
On the other side, you could, or I'm sorry, the warm colors, <laughs> red, orange, yellow. And on the other side, you could grind the cool colors, purple, blue, green. And then here too, <laughs> my students would use these. And I mean, the grinding stone you saw there, the black one, the slate one, and these are over 30 years old because I've been using them in all the year long classes. And so it's a testimony to their longevity. And with these, they may look stained. And quite honestly, the students were you would grind the ink in here and then they would let it sit and they would letter with that ink all day. And finally, at the end of the day, they would clean it out. So this little bit of staining here has absolutely no impact on the ink you're using at the time. So I think the Gaken dishes are a different shape and only one-sided now. And I want to talk to you and show you something about those uh, ink sticks. So uh, in terms of taking a step back, here's a picture of black stick ink being made, one of the first steps. Here is a little glass dome right here. It's being held with some bamboo prongs. And underneath it, as you can see right here, there is a saucer of oil, a specific oil. Usually it's pine oil these days. And so they're burning very slowly with a wick. And then the soot rises from that wick and collects on this glass dome. And then uh, from time to time, they scrape it off. And then when they have enough, and obviously they've got a bunch going at a time here, they go on to the next step of adding glue and forming it. It's a very, very, very long, dirty, hand-done process. Once you see it, it's, you'll go, huh, no wonder they cost so much. And now you, I'll go back to the ink stick that I'm using, which is the uh, older one. And these are the newer ones right here. These are what the newer ones look like. And so, you know, I'm an old fogey. And so when I was told by John Neal, oh yeah, they totally redid the formulation of the uh, pigmentations and the color of these. And I was going, uh-huh, new, huh? Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, John sent me all of them. And so here they all are. And I've ground them in my Gaken dishes. And then I've put them into the indentations of the mixing pans. And here are the catalog numbers on them. And I have to say something. Number one, they were easier to grind than the previous generations of color ink sticks from Boca Undo. That was pleasant. And number two, virtually every single color flowed with really good control of flow. Uh, that really surprised me because um, back in the day with the um, traditional ones that I had gotten used to over three decades, I think they made about 18 of them. And maybe six or seven of them I recommended to my students. The rest of them, they did not flow with good enough control. That's my criteria for any fluid I use is how, what, how good a control does it have coming off a metal nib, whether it's broad edged or pointed. And, you know, that cuts out a lot of the real seductive colors that you'll see. You see a peacock blue or a flame red or a sunrise yellow. And you go, oh God, that's so pretty. It, it must be good. And then you try and use it and it's just like, oh no, I'm pulling teeth here. And so uh, I'll go back, stop the screen share, come back here. And so you can see it's a very different shape. It's more of a traditional shape of an ink stick. And so this is the, the, the shape they were for as long as I was using them, which is about 200 years. So um, I'll grind this for you on the side for the hot colors. And you'll see there's not much of a difference in terms of uh, what you're doing. Once again, the only drawback here is that it's very flat and shallow. So what I would do here is what I had suggested with what you would have done with this type of slate stone for the black. I would grind some and pour it off, grind some and pour it off, grind some and pour it off. Because otherwise, once it gets not shallow, but deep, you really can't get an accurate visual read on the consistency of the fluid. So I'll just do the same thing here. So right now, these are gone. Boku Undo does not make these. But I was more than happy 
with the new ones. So I would do the same thing here. I envision about the shape or width of a, a nickel or a dime. And then I simply try to get the leverage that I want and do this. Now I know whether it's the black stick ink or the color ink sticks, there are people who will say, ah, you have to cleanse yourself. Put on your finest white linen, sit cross-legged, say your mantra, cleanse your mind, and then hold the ink stick straight up and down. And then and only then can you grind the ink stick properly. Well, I come from a little bit more pragmatic direction. And what I find is this, that once I have done grinding the stick ink, whether it's black or red or whatever, during the time I'm grinding this, I'm usually going through the steps of, you know, in all the workups that I've done, I had a bad time spacing these few words over here, or I had a spelling error over there. I'm going over in my mind all the things that I want to make sure I'm ready for. And so in a sense, in a Western practical, pragmatic sense, I am clearing my mind that way. And in holding the ink stick, whether it's the black or the color, uh, all I want to do is get the leverage on it that makes it easy to grind. And uh, it works for me. So uh, if you try and it works for you, I hope it does. So right now, this is really thick right now. And so I'm just going to stop. And I'm going to put that much more water in it again and go to town again. And I would say... The principle of three, <laughs> water and grind it thick, water and grind it thick, water and grind it thick. I would then just use the brush, clean brush, to uh, take out whatever's in here and put it into one of the indentations of a mixing pan and then work from that. Now, something very different. One of the things that Boca Undo goes out of their way to tell you is that the color stick inks are inorganic, and that's good. That's really good. Because once you have ground up all you want to, and you have transferred it into the indentation of a mixing pan, you can let it dry out. And then you can use it like a pan of watercolor. Anytime you want to, you can come back and reconstitute it and use it, and not worry about that stringy, slimy thing happening that happened to the organic chain of binder in the black sticky because this is inorganic and that's not gonna happen. So that's a happy day. So there's a difference between the color stick inks being inorganic where you can let them dry in those indentations of a mixing pan, come back, reconstitute it just like you would a pan of watercolor and then let it dry out again for another day. This is pretty thick right now. Generally, the colors will grind faster than the black, and especially the new versions of them. I was really surprised how much faster they ground. Any questions right now about our color sticking, our bacon dish, anything you want to ask about? There are a couple questions. Are the yeah. colored, Laura Stevenson asks, are the colored sticks blendable? Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is great. This is great. Uh, in my year-long class, what I have students do is I start them out with some very reliable, specific colors in gouache that are really good for control off a of metal nib. And so they have confidence with those. And I have them mix a color chart with the gouaches. And then we switch over to black stick ink. And by that time, they have enough of a touch with the uh, wash. So the very first time they use the black stick ink, it's, wow, this stuff is really good and we can really appreciate it. And then the color ink stick as well, the ones that I recommended. And at this point, I'll recommend all of the new color ones because they were so good. And then we go on down the road and we use dry pigments. And there are certain colors there that have very good control. 
And so part of that is the reason I give them that is so they can see that they have control over any medium they want. And then also what they experience is this. They can take the best of the gouaches and the best of the color stickings and the best of the dry pigments and mix all with each other. All you have to do is get each one to the consistency that you would use it at and then blend that color stick ink with that gouache. Mix that, color, that gouache with that dry pigment. Mix that dry pigment with that color stick ink. And it opens up a world of colors because my criteria for choosing the colors to use to letter with were not how pretty they were. So you may not have a full spectrum in gouaches or full spectrum in color stickings or full spectrum in dry pigments, but you will have a full spectrum given all three media. So it's wonderful that you can mix every one with the other. Good question. So Anything you're saying else? that all the new colors are good? I, there was not one stinker in terms of the grinding or the control of flow. Even the black, even the black that was a color sticking. I was surprised how good that was. And by the way, the prices are reasonable. Most of them were between like uh, nine and $15, I think. I think. I don't hold me to it. So, so this is, I mean, this is a lot right here. And this is where I would stop and I would pour this into the indentation and then start again and do some more and do some more. And then, like I say, I always do like three go rounds. And then I go, okay, I've had it. That's it. I'm, I'm good to go. And then here too, we would do the same thing. Take a cotton cloth and then wipe off till it's almost dry. Because once again, you could actually wind up pulling off some of the fibers from the cotton cloth here. Old t-shirt, old handkerchief. And then once again, let it air dry and then put it away in its box, put the box into a Ziploc baggie with a desiccant. Overkill, but that's okay. You want these things to last. Here too, you can just take your serrated blade, cut it in half, split it with a buddy and you got it for a long time. By the way, the uh, color, I have great confidence in the longevity and archival quality of the colors that Boku Uno makes. They're that reliable. What questions do you have, guys? I could never mix the stick colored sticking together. Maybe it was too thick. Maybe it was too thick. You know, there. So, like, you take uh, certain ones. And I, well, the one that jumps to mind for me was the yellow ochre. And that yellow ochre that they make, I just love that because of the color, but also it does something. It kind of modulates. It's not totally opaque and it's not totally transparent. So when you write with it on the page, it kind of just moves. You know, when you get about a few lines written, it's not consistent in color. And some people just hate that. But I love the quality of that happening. Uh, how, once again, the color just modulates across the page. And if you were trying to mix that with something else, it would just kind of drive you batty because it's kind of separating out cer certain colors in the stickings, in gouaches, et cetera. Uh, you mix it up and then a couple minutes later, it's separated into thicker and thinner parts. But, and that's not just peculiar to the color ink sticks, but to gouaches and dry pigments as well. Certain ones just do that. So it could be that. Yeah. What else? I, I always forget this, forget this, that I can be human. <laughs> <laughs> well, almost human, you know. So Reggie yeah. Della asks about paper and ink sticks. Yes, yes. Oh, you know, that's just it. Um, oh, there are so many papers out there. Uh, when, when people are beginning, intermediate, advanced even, uh, two papers that I, I have people work on a lot are Arches Watercolor Hot Press. And I usually suggest 90 pound because you can run though that weight, it's almost like, cover, like um, card weight. You can run that through a copier to make lines on them. 
okay? And uh, Arch's water press 90 pound is thick enough so you can let her on both sides. It's just, and I know people go, oh, I don't want to waste money on it be frugal. But you try and fill up both sides of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper with a modest size nib, say a two millimeter nib, whatever lettering cell you want, it's going to take you probably two days to fill up both sides. And so what you're doing there by using good paper, you know then what good paper should feel like. Often people will make a dichotomy, uh, practice world and <gasps> real work world. And they get fearful when they have to go from practice to real. Well, if you practice with good sticking, if you practice with good paper, Arches Watercolor Hot Press 90 Pound, then there's no intimidation going from practice to real. Also another paper that's good for practice, and, and I'm not just saying practice because these papers are good for finished work, um, is Strathmore 400 drawing. Now, one of the things I will tell you is get a pouch of gum sandarac. Gum sandarac is a powder. I know John Neal sells it in a pouch like this. And if you give a little dusting to your paper like that, an excessive amount comes off. So then let's say this is my piece of paper right here. And I give it a dusting of gum sandarac. Well, there's an excessive amount on there. And if I try to letter on that like that, it can literally gum up your nib, not permanently for a minute. You know, so what you have to do is you have to take the paper and from the back side, thump it off a few times, and then up a little puffs. And now you do have just the right amount of gum sandrac on there. And the gum sandrac is almost magic in that it helps prepare papers so that you'll get a finer writing line on it, more crisp writing. And that uh, is true whether the paper is a little bit too absorbent or a little bit too greasy. Uh, gum sandrac, you're, you'll be so glad that you have it when you go to do work. It's great. Um, is, 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 that, is that good to tell you about those two? Yes. And, 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 and the compatibility of stick ink and paper, you're just going to be so glad. The reasons I suggest the things I do for writing for my students is because those are all particle base. They're pigmented base. So what they do is those particles, here's my paper, here's the particle. It sits upon the top of the paper and is bound to the top of the paper by the glue. Oops, I made a mistake. I can come with my exacto knife and I can scrape away that particle of pigment. Whereas if you have something that's like a fountain pen ink, it's dye base and it goes into the fibers and you can never correct it. So whether it's gouache, certain gouaches, or uh, stick inks or the dry pigments, I suggest with certain colors, um, that's why I suggest them because they have great control and you can and you can correct. And those two surfaces are tough enough. Often if you have a hot press paper, then you're going to be able to make a correction. Okay. One last so, question. Yeah. Do you ever use a brush with stick inks instead of a nib? You know, I, I haven't. That's that's a good question. I haven't. But when I do use a brush let's say a broad edge brush, and I'm doing broad edge brush lettering, uh, I have a palette, you know, like a, a meat tray is good. And I squeeze out a little, <laughs> a wormlet <laughs> of gouache at one end, and I've got water at the other. And so I saturate my brush, and then I touch it to the little tube of gouache there. And then I will palette my brush and palette my brush and palette my brush. So I like to start out with something that's somewhat solid to begin with, like the worm, the wormlet <laughs> that you squeeze out of the gouache. And then I control it by palleting out on that slick surface, exactly a nice, nice chisel edge to that uh, broad edge brush. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm using um, a pointed brush, I always use the uh, Pentel color brush. Now, of course, the colors inside the handle are fugitive. They're beautiful. But so if you're using something that is just for, you know, reproduction or short-lived, that's no concern. But if you are concerned about something lasting long, take the Pintel color brush and don't remove the little collar on it. Leave it. 
So that that is such a good brush and inexpensive. If you mix up your gouache or your watercolor, whatever you're using, you can use that as a dip brush and then just dismantle it and flush it out top, bottom, and reuse it again. Uh, I love doing this, guys. I just love being with you. I do. Thank you so much for doing this for us. We've really, really thank you. It. Uh, thanks for asking me. I was. It's a. It's a pleasure to be away from cold Chicago in in warm New Mexico right now. <laughs> oh, we do wish <laughs> you were here. That's for sure. Thank I, you. I would love to be there. I would love to be thank there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys. Uh, right. Ask me again to do anything anytime, and uh, I'll okay. be happy to do it. And if if uh, if you want to get any. Thing for me, you know, I, I send out every Monday the pick of the week, and it's always inspiring. It's a piece of work. And uh, all the picks of the week for the last 10 years are archived on my uh, homepage of my website. And so you can go there and see these fabulous things that students have done over the last 10 years. But also, I would like to send you info uh, on future courses that I'm giving via Zoom. Most especially the new 26 seeds a year to grow. So if you don't, if you're not sure if uh, you, I have your email, please send it to me, you know. Okay, then uh, have fun at your meeting. And uh, this would be a great meeting to share pizza at or something, you know, if only we could do that. Well, so, someday maybe you can. I hope so, I hope so, a real li real life people. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. Thank you so very, very much. Ready. Okay. Take care, guys. You I'm heading now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.